Arcade games were a huge part of console gaming during the golden age of video games. While many of us undoubtedly piddled away our hard-earned allowance on such games, the ability to play these same titles at home often cushioned the blow that our meager pittance dealt to our slim wallets. More often than not, though, the home ports of popular arcade games were often inferior watered-down versions of their coin-op counterparts. Not only was this the norm in the 1980s and 90s, but it was also to be expected. But every now and then we would seldom be surprised with a fantastic home port that actually eclipsed the arcade original in gameplay, mechanics, and sometimes even <gasps> graphics and sound. Here are five of those home ports that I feel are even better than their quarter munching originals. Released in arcades back in 1988, POW adhered to the military aesthetic that SNK was already known for, and cashing in on the growing popularity of the arcade beat em up threw their hat into the ring with Prisoners of War. The game is your typical late 80s beat-em-up, and while the fighting mechanics of the game are basic at best, POW does have a different feel to it as opposed to the brawlers we were seeing around that same time. And the game is tough, no doubt designed to extort quarters from pockets like the life savings of gullible geriatrics. With so many arcade games being ported over to the Nintendo Entertainment System, POW received the same treatment, with surprisingly great graphics and music. You see, when POW was released, SNK was one of those companies that I associated on the third-party barometer below the level of mediocrity. Frankly, their game sucked. So what a surprise I was in store for when my friend talked me into getting POW, and the game was actually pretty damn good. While the settings resembled the arcade original for the most part, with watered-down visuals of course, the graphics were still fairly impressive for an 8-bit game. But shitting out just another 8-bit brawler wasn't going to be enough for POW to stand out from the rest, so a few extras were added to enhance the gameplay. In the NES version, you're able to enter the huts that make up the prison camp from which you've been liberated. Inside of these hovels, you encounter baddies that relinquish much-needed items to make your escape a bit more manageable. This feature is absent from the arcade game. The stages in both share the same settings, and both are long and laborious. Each stage on the NES version ends with a boss battle, while the arcade version ends its stages with waves of enemies, save for stage 4. Hell, the arcade version lacks even a final boss! While the game also shares many of the same or similar character sprites, when it comes to the music, the NES version tops the arcade hands down. While sharing the same Stage 1 theme in both, which is an excellent song by the way, the rest of the stages between the two games have completely different tunes, and I gotta say, the NES just has better compositions. But what about two-player co-op play? Okay, so yeah, what was a common theme for early 8-bit brawlers, the two-player mode that made the arcade original so endearing is unfortunately absent from the home port. Yeah, but the cover has two dudes on it. Yes, yes it does. I'll admit, as soon as I got home from purchasing this game, the first thing I did before even playing it was call my friend to come over so that we could tear it up on some two-player action. While initially disappointed, we soon forgave this usually unforgivable transgression as the game was very challenging and fun. But the cover has two dudes on it! Be that as it may, the NES version of POW is superior in almost every facet, and despite the lack of two-player co-op in the home version, it is in my opinion, the definitive one to play. Two dudes! When comparing the arcade version of Trojan with its NES counterpart, it almost seems like a no-brainer, and in many ways, it is just that. Set in a post-apocalyptic setting, Trojan mixes up the ruins of technology with the most basic of bludgeoning weapons, with the protagonist even sporting a sword and shield. As the vast wasteland is saturated with savage mutants, you could argue that the control scheme of Trojan is a bit savage in itself. In both, the sword is operated with one button, while defending with the shield is controlled by the other. This means that up is used for jumping, which is arguably a deal breaker right then and there. Top that off with an almost insurmountable difficulty curve, and most people just may say fuck it when it comes to Trojan. Yeah.
But what was typical of Capcom in regards to its early arcade to home ports, they added a few extras into the mix to make it stand out over the arcade original. Trojan on the NES has several hidden rooms throughout the adventure, often yielding several power-ups and health-replenishing items. The stages, graphics, and music are near identical between the two, save for the obvious hardware limitations of the 8-bit cart, but this is Capcom after all, so the home version ain't too shabby at all. It even has a boss that was absent from the arcade game. But the main draw for me which makes the NES version trump the arcade is simple. Gameplay. Just listen to what my buddy Technicolor Dojo had to say in his Trojan review. Originally known by the infinitely cooler name, Requiem for Battle, it was released in Japan to arcades in 1986. It was also a brutal, turbocharged, quarter gobbling shit show with erratic enemy patterns and an intense speed that frankly isn't very fun. Capcom realized this and in February of 87, the home version was an ambitious port that stays true to the cabinet as well as reimagines and innovates. I couldn't have said it better myself. And top that off with a cherry in the form of some pretty sweet profile graphics for each boss during the ending versus the arcade version, and you simply have a much more aesthetically pleasing game. And the NES version has a fun, albeit primitive one-on-one -on -one versus mode. Nuff said. Atomic Runner Chernov is a 1988 arcade game by Data East. Controversial in subject matter, the name Chernov is derived from Chernobyl, where the protagonist gained superpowers while surviving the nuclear catastrophe that took place there. The arcade game takes place in a dark and forlorn, desolate setting, where Chernov is set into continuous moving stages where he needs to jump and shoot to survive. Due to its controversial origin story, when Chernov was ported to the Sega Genesis in 1992, the game received a complete overhaul in the visuals and story department, instead placing our hero amongst ruins once inhabited by ancient civilizations. But the stage layouts, enemy placements, obstacles, and bosses for the most part are exactly the same despite their cosmetic differences. The progress map in between stages is even present, although slightly different in both versions. The arcade original has two excellent music tracks and a boss theme for the entire game. While the Sega version did retain these three songs as the first and final stage themes, not to mention the bosses, each additional stage in the Genesis version has brand new, brilliantly composed music, some of the best on the entire console. No joke, Atomic Runner has one of the best soundtracks on the Genesis, period, and is reason enough to own the game, besides the fact that it is simply awesome. And I promise that you haven't ever played anything quite like it. For these reasons alone, the home version blows away the original akin to a level 7 event, not unlike an exploding nuclear reactor. For a shooter slash platformer hybrid, Atomic Runner is one of those gems that just begs to be discovered. With its bright and vibrant aesthetics outdoing the arcade's drab ones, coupled with its fantastic score, Atomic Runner on the Genesis makes the arcade version all but forgotten. Konami's classic tube shooter hit arcades during the infamous video game crash of 1983, and if not for its resurrection on the NES five years later, may have all but slipped through the cracks of obscurity. The game was unique for an old arcade shooter, borrowing elements from Tempest, but with the NES adaptation came a fresh coat of paint. The graphics had a revamped late 80s look to it, and coupled with Konami's signature chiptunes, destroys the arcade version in almost every way possible. The arcade has the same music played throughout the entire game, while the NES version also has the same song, enhanced in all its finest 8-bit NES glory, while adding another on top of boss music and a bonus stage theme.
While not a whole lot of tracks for the 20 plus stages that Gyrus has to offer, it sure as hell beats only one song, and the four included within the home port are nothing short of astounding. Which makes sense, since the NES adaptation has more levels than the arcade anyway. On your trip to each planet within the solar system, you encounter three stages. Two regular ones concluded with a chance stage. There's a little more to it than just that on the home version. On the NES, the first and third stages resemble the first two for each planet in the arcade original, while the second stage on the home port each has four enemy pods to destroy, which hover within the center of the screen. The third stage for each planet concludes with a boss battle, while the fourth and final stage for each planet ends with its chance stage. Of course, all of this is much more feasible with bombs in tow. Completely absent from the arcade version, Gyrus on the NES has bombs that can be collected and are best utilized against the pods and bosses which plague all nine planets orbiting the sun. I've never seen or heard an alien, and hell, I don't even know if they exist. But one thing that I do know is that it's fun as hell blasting them all to some sort of infernal extraterrestrial Valhalla, where they will undoubtedly suffer for all eternity. NES wins this one, hands down, baby. I'd buy that for a dollar! And the final game on the list is one of my all-time favorites. Smash TV heavily borrowed elements from the 1987 Schwarzenegger flick The Running Man, where contestants compete on a game show to win a king's ransom and prizes, with only their measly lives at stake. The arcade original utilized a twin stick feature just like with its spiritual predecessor Robotron 2084. This allows you to fire in eight different directions, perforating droves of baddies as they close in on you within numerous four-walled cells. The home version on the Super Nintendo is nearly identical except for a few minor differences. Since the home version doesn't offer a controller with dual sticks, or dual D-pads for that matter, the four-lettered buttons, which is in the same shape as a compass rose, serves as the additional D-pad. You simply press whichever button corresponds with the direction that you wish to fire. It works brilliantly. In fact, I prefer two D-pads over two sticks any day, merely for the fact that I can change firing directions on a dime with buttons versus an additional joystick. Hell yeah! But one of the biggest improvements over the arcade original is by far the music. The tunes in the arcade version sound flat and tinny, not unlike in many arcade games from that late 80s, early 90s era, while the SNES version hits you in the face like a sledgehammer. Many of the voices are retained in the home version. Big money! Big prizes! I love it! And other than some of Nintendo's patented censorship, the visuals are damn near identical. Pretty impressive for a 16-bit game. I'll gladly sacrifice some comedic gore in favor of a much better soundtrack. No contest. Add to this that the SNES version doesn't suffer from any slowdown whatsoever, and also has hidden secret rooms, and it's a no-brainer which version is tops here. So while not necessarily common, these are five arcade to home ports that are actually better than the originals. While this sort of list may seem tough to come up with, I know that I've left a few conspicuously absent from my own. This is where you come in. Which arcade to home ports do you feel are better than the arcade originals? Let me know in the comments below. I'm curious to find out what other games are out there that made improvements when ported to our living rooms. As always, I want to thank you all for watching. I'll catch you guys later.